Okay. So let me know. Is is you have muted? Let me know when it um, starts recording. Yeah, I started recording. Oh, great. All right, everybody. So welcome to the training. Thank you very much. I was just saying to Ran that it's really interesting in the United States, you have to set training up six months in advance, but in Greece, you have to set it up the day before and then you get people. So I'm delighted that so many people have, have been able to join us. Um, and I, I'm doing two presentations. The fr they're both about 40 minutes and we'll have a little break for questions in between. OK, um, and, and the first one is about coping with infant feeding in emergencies. And for those of you who are not so familiar with the field, you know, infant feeding in emergencies is a field all onto itself. It is um, a field that has its own science, it has its own guidelines and everything, um, and it's got WHO and UNICEF behind it. So infant feeding in emergencies is really a whole field of study and practice in and of itself. Um, I like to call this talk, Don't Drop the Baby, because I think we always have to remember basics first. Um, and, you know, the basics of all medicine and medical practice and health related practices, first, do no harm. Um, and I always tell my students and those I work with that, you know, the most important thing really is don't drop the baby. You're going to be handling babies. And <laughs> as long as you don't drop the baby, there's not an awful lot else you can do wrong within the scope of practice that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and I do want it to be a sort of realistic talk. I think one of the problems sometimes with all these guidelines and these different very long um, guidance books and rules is that people don't actually have time to read them in the field. So the goal for my perform my presentation today is really to find the most important things and talk to you about those because some of these guidelines are so long that no one ever reads them. So I will just give you a very little bit of background about cheering and, and for e infant feeding in emergencies. And then we're going to talk about exclusive breastfeeding and the recommendations. And then we're going to go into some more practical things about infant growth and how we work with growth charts. So first of all, um, I'm actually based, well, I'm in more than one country really, but I do um, have a position at Boston University School of Medicine where I'm a PhD and I've been there for about 30 years. Um, and we do a lot of programmatic work across the United States, almost all focused on breastfeeding. Um, I'm an associate professor there at BU. And, and this is my team. Some of these people are based here in Greece. Uh, many of them are based all over the United States. Um, we have a very big focus on equity and diversity and inclusion, and we try to reflect that in the people who work from, for us. So we have people here from many countries speaking many languages, and that is intentional. Um, it's part of the strategy that we use when we're reaching populations. Um, Cheering is the Center for Health Equity, Education and Research. It's based at Boston University in the US, but we work across the US um, and we particularly right now focusing on Mississippi and a lot of recent work with American Indian tribes. And Cheering um, is our partner here in Athens. Um, and as I say, we focus mainly on infant feeding and maternal child health and preventive health in the perinatal period before and after the baby is born. And our goal is really to increase exclusive breastfeeding rates here in Greece among refugee populations. Um, in other places, almost always we work with disadvantaged populations. So um, that is really what we try to work on. Um, and to also provide this kind of training exactly like I'm doing today to try and train organizations on the front lines uh, because I can go and help 10 women today, but all of you can help 10 women tomorrow. And then you, we have 100 women we've helped tomorrow. And the more and the more people that we can train um, and you can train, the better it is rather than us trying to do all the hands-on work ourselves. So we do hands-on work, but really our mission is to train many other people as well. So um, we do do direct service to some of the camps here in Athens and the Elna Maternity Centre. We also collaborate with the Greek Galaxias organisation, which is the lactation consultants of Greece, and they have many doctors um, in that organisation as well. So especially when we don't have COVID to deal with, we have had a little bit more of a challenge getting out there recently, but we run, we run what we call our weekly grow clinics. Um, we do some training with reproductive health, nutrition and breastfeeding, and we're happy to do those for anybody who is interested. Um, but for the moms and the babies, we really do monitoring of growth and support breastfeeding. 
Um, so just to back it up a little bit, I'm talking about infant feeding in emergencies. It's kind of interesting that really the whole world is in emergency now. Um, suddenly the work I'm doing in America seems much more relevant to the work we're doing in other countries because COVID-19 has put the whole world into an international emergency. Um, other emergencies we might think of are, you know, more physical things like hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, war. And I would argue that the entire refugee situation is an emergency. Um, emergencies are characterized by most difficult conditions for those who are extremely poor and have poor living conditions to begin with who live in an ongoing state of emergency. And even I would say in the United States, when we work with the American Indian tribes, we are working with people who are living in an ongoing state of emergencies. So um, that is really the background to what I'm going to be talking about. And the things that emergencies have in common are poor access to basic necessities, unreliable um, sources of power and fuel, not necessarily clean water, you'll see where I'm heading here, um, nowhere to boil or sterilize the water, not great access to food, infant food, infant formula, and people living in a state of high stress and poor health. Um, this was a nice uh, little story that was out on the BBC um, back in March last year, um, when everybody was being told to wear masks and wash their hands and do all this stuff. And this was pointing out that many people in the most vulnerable communities were simply not able to do things like sleep in a separate room, use hand sanitizer. Um, and I would say that exactly the same thing happens for formula feeding. So um, we promote breastfeeding as the healthiest thing because we know that formula feeding really is not practical in an emergency. What do you have to do to feed formula? You have to be able to boil water. This is to feed safely, right? You have to be able to um, sterilize the bottles. You have to use the correct amount of formula. Formula is very expensive. The instructions. So we work with people in the camps who um, may not be able to read at all. They certainly can't read Greek, most of them. They may be able to read their language but the food may be being sent from China or Holland or anywhere. Most of the time, the instructions on the cans of formula are not in the language that a person that is in the camp can read. Therefore, people don't know how to make it. So before anybody hands anybody a can of formula, which is usually in powdered form, you need to be know, able to know exactly how to make it too. Um, you, need, you might not be able to read the instructions either because many of us only speak one or two languages and we may most of us may not speak Chinese for example and that means that they need to be because they need to also be able to mix it properly and not dilute it with too much water which is what people do when they have not enough funding to buy enough formula they dilute it and then your baby doesn't get enough food then you have to be able to refrigerate it then you're supposed to throw away any of this expensive formula that hasn't been used um, and you have to do all this 10 times a day. It's not, it's not going to happen, right? And then this is a very sad picture that is actually from UNICEF of a woman who is feeding twins. And the boy twin, these are twins, the boy twin um, did great um, because he was breastfeeding and the girl twin was bottle fed and died. Uh, and the mother said, please use my picture if it will help. Um, when you think of these emergency conditions people are living in, um, we do not necessarily have vaccinations to prevent illness. We know for a fact, because we've checked, that many, most of the babies in the big camps don't have their vaccinations. They don't have access to antibiotics to treat infection or medications in general. They don't have access to routine preventive care or consistent medical care. They don't have consistent advice and support from medical professionals. That's not just refugees or people in crisis. That's everybody. Medical professionals tend to be very inconsistent in their um, information. And then, of course, many of the women that we're working with do not have support from their families. Um, older women, maybe the grandma or the mother-in-law helps to um, helps the mother to to take care of the baby in her own culture and helps her to learn to breastfeed um, and, and she's not there. And also we do have a tendency to think, I've heard this said, you know, that, oh, well, people are coming from these poor countries, they must know how to breastfeed or they must breastfeed. I mean, nobody 
knows how to breastfeed automatically necessarily and not all countries breastfeed some countries like greece have very low breastfeeding rates so don't assume that a certain culture will know more about breastfeeding than another by the way if you guys have any questions while i'm um talking please feel free to write them into the chat because i can take some questions at the end of the session so yes sometimes we think oh it's going to be really hard to get people to breastfeed but i can tell you it's really hard to get people to formula feed safely um, and i know that those of you who work with um, ngos and agencies have a lot of trouble often uh, procuring formula for people because people don't have it and what we see is that they're basically feeding cow's milk with sugar in it quite often so actually breastfeeding is is realistic um, and anything else is likely to be harmful so this is a poster from uh, unicef give baby only breast milk for the first six months um, and this is true you do not need anything except breast milk i'll go into that in a moment um, so babies don't need any water, any other fluid or any other food for the first six months of life. Um, and we'll talk about the rest of infant life in a moment. There are recommendations out there. The WHO recommends exclusive breastfeeding for six months. The WHO also recommends continued breastfeeding to two years or beyond um, as the mother and child wish. This is very culture dependent. The Quran uh, recommends or suggests two years of breastfeeding. Um, some cultures think that's just crazy. They have no idea. They've never seen people breastfeed for more than a few weeks, but actually that is the recommendation. And if you think of it in terms of the um, WHO, they are also thinking about uh, child spacing and the beneficial impact it has on a woman's body, not to have too many children all at once. So breastfeeding, it's not a reliable birth control method. Please don't go off and use it as birth control yourselves or recommend it. But certainly it, it does delay the return of fertility. Um, and if people are breastfeeding consistently and regularly for six months and they don't get the period back, then their fertility is very much delayed. So it helps with that as well. And then you do need to start solid foods at six months. Um, the WHO recommends breastfeeding exclusively and also says this information here that they would save over 800,000 lives a year, um, most of them in children under six months if everybody exclusively breastfed. It would dramatically prevent diarrhea and respiratory infections. And also breastfeeding has benefits for the mother, such as protection against developing breast cancer. Um, and the WHO said it would, would prevent an extra 20,000 deaths from breast cancer in women. There is um, a really good series in the Lancet Journal that has all this data in it. For the children that we see, we actually are working in a situation where breastfeeding prevents acute immediate illness and we don't see that as much in countries where people have access to all the other things I talked about. But here, if people are not formula feeding safely, then you get sick babies. Um, we have had mothers often say, we don't know what to feed our babies. I mean, they, they, people don't know and they, they come in at four months, for example, to the shelter and the baby's been getting all sorts of stuff and, and you know they just don't know people don't know so that those kids get sick then they end up in the hospital then you're exposed to covid and everything else you also have moms asking consistently for formula because they don't have money and they end up feeding something else sometimes just water to try and fill the baby's tummy and then you get sicker and sicker babies um, in the long term, breastfeeding also, I won't bore you by reading this, but it prevents all sorts of stuff. Um, these are the things we look at in countries where we're not as much um, in despair about short term effects. I mean, if you've got access to all the easy living stuff, then you might not have acutely sick babies under six months. But certainly all of these things on this page um, and more. Um, are prevented by breastfeeding or certainly reduced, including, by the way, COVID now. They finally come around to realising that, which, of course, everybody knew before because breastfeeding um, prevents against virus illnesses anyway. Um, and then you may not know, but women who breastfeed also have all sorts of health benefits, such as a reduced risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. There is absolutely loads of literature on this. It is very exhausting and boring to have to keep proving to people that breastfeeding works because in the long run you know you have the longest natural selection and evolution we have evolved to provide the best food for our babies but we now have all the science to help us tell people about that 
And then um, benefits for breastfeeding women um, in our situations and in all cultures, actually, not just where we are right now. But as you may know, um, and, and you may see when you work with these people, um, it helps mother's self-esteem. I was talking to a friend today, a friend that you all know, but I won't name her. Um, and she said, you know, he's gained so, so many ounces and it's just my milk. And this is a woman, you know, who's already got great self-esteem. If you have mothers in a shelter or a camp and they see their baby grow and this almost makes me cry and they see their baby grow to six months and it's just their milk that incredibly boosts their confidence and their self-esteem um, they can do something for the child that nobody else um, can do for the child it empowers and fulfills them it connects them to a certain normalcy like every woman in the world can do this and so they're you know for once there's a bond that everybody shares that didn't matter where you are who you are what where you've come from um, and then of course it's free and you know that nobody has any money in these situations and diapers really cost a fortune too so if they're breastfeeding they don't have to pay for diapers I mean, for, they do have to pay for diapers, they have to pay for formula. Um, and in a physiological way, when I said about COVID, breastfeeding preve prevents against viruses because the mother makes in her system antibodies. So if the mother's exposed to anything like the flu or the common cold or anything like that, chickenpox, anything, she makes antibodies and those antibodies pass through the milk and go into the baby and it prevents, it will help prevent the baby getting sick sick um, and a little bit later in the talk I'm going to talk to you about medications and milk um, but also human milk sets up the flora in the baby's gut so when the baby is first born um, and it breastfeeds that sets up the whole immune system for the child for the rest of its life um, as opposed to if it's given cow's milk which triggers a response of the immune system and a bad response because it's actually having to deal with a foreign protein so breast milk milk sets up the baby's the whole life of the baby um, from the beginning so some of you may be saying oh my goodness really only breast milk for six months how we can do that how can we do that um, so the reality is that as long as the baby has access to the breast now obviously if they're in a hospital and they're you know 10 miles away from the mother in a nursery and they don't have access to the breast then someone's going to feed them something else um, but as long as they have access to the breast whenever they want to feed so that's like demand feeding when the baby's hungry then they they don't need any extra water fluid or anything else before six months the one sort of caveat to that is vitamin d so vitamin d um, deficiency is very common in women who don't have enough sunshine exposure um, or have dark skin um, and babies of mothers who are deficient are born vitamin D deficient. So you're already thinking about your mothers who were veiled or clothed. You know, even in England, actually, you know, we, you know, we, if it sun shines, we all go out in the sun immediately in England and take half our clothes off and get as much sun as we possibly can. But in the past, um, women, in, everybody in England got rickets because they were working long hours in factories and we don't have very much sunshine. So vitamin D deficiency is very, very common, but it's particularly common in women who don't get sunshine and have dark skin. If the skin is darker, it doesn't metabolize um, the vitamin D as quickly and make it. Um, vitamin D is called um, vitamin D is called a vitamin or a vitamin. It's not actually a vitamin um, and we don't actually get it from food. It's quite difficult to get it from food. We get it from the sunshine on our skin. So um, breast milk does not contain very much vitamin D because it's never really meant to be coming from food. Um, it's, it's quite difficult actually to make it, to get it into food, um, which is why it's been taken so long for people to even know what vitamin D deficiency is. So um, I'm just checking my time here. Um, so as long as babies have access to the breast, they get everything, but they don't necessarily get the vitamin D. So we do recommend supplements of vitamin D. And actually, pregnant women should really be getting plenty of vitamin D as well in these circumstances. So that is the one thing that babies should get. There is vitamin D already added to formula, supplemented in formula, which is a good thing in the formula. Um, and another reason that if they're not getting formula, but they're just getting regular milk, there won't be enough vitamins in the milk for them. And then as we mentioned at six months, women really need to get their baby started on solids. Um, the main thing that they need from, this, from their initial solids is iron. 
um, breastfeeding, breast milk is low in iron as it's supposed to be. Babies are born with a lot of iron stores. They don't need to get very much from the milk. It's come from their mother's blood um, before they're born, but from the cord and the placenta. But when they get to six months, those stores of, of iron start to get uh, to run out and they don't have enough iron. They need solid foods. Also, for, obviously for calories, other vitamins and minerals like zinc, but they really need to get solid food. So, um, you know, we too much, too long breastfeeding is not a good thing. Now they must continue or should continue to breastfeed. I'm not saying they should stop at six months and start solids, but they must start to add solids at six months. And what they start with is a whole other ball game. And you shouldn't worry about any one country saying you must start with this solid or that solid, because every country, every culture starts with different solids. Um, some cultures start with bananas, some with avocado, some with cereal, some with meat. Meat's fine. It's got lots of iron in it. Nothing wrong with babies getting meat. So, um, you know, there's lots of things that they can start with. Um, and again, just work with them to get them started. The point is to get them started on something around about six months. So in terms of working with babies, um, some of you will have experience in that and some of you may not. Um, the first absolute first thing to be aware of is to practice clean care. I can't emphasize this enough. We're setting examples to people that we work with. We want them to feel that the babies are safe with them. So the very first thing I teach everybody that we work with is to make sure everything we use is clean. Okay, so you want to clean the surfaces, if you're handling one baby and then another baby, you absolutely must wash or sanitize your hands between the babies. Um, any kind of activity with babies and children. Um, you know, if you get baby A coming in, it picks something up and puts its mouth, puts it in its mouth and then puts it down. And then baby B comes in, you want to make sure that whatever baby A just put in his mouth is not going to be put in baby B's mouth. Okay, so keep everything clean and sterile don't use like if you if you're giving toys to babies to keep them entertained don't use things that are like soft that are really like you don't get you know you're not you're not going to be able to make them clean again get rid of anything that's not hard plastic or washable and of course you don't want them to choke so just watch that too um so it's important for you as professionals to do that and it's important to model that for the parents as well so that they feel safe with you with the baby and then the other rule is feed the baby. So yes, I'm a complete advocate for breastfeeding and we know that breastfeeding is best. Um, and and it's, it, you know, it's, it's the only way really. However, if you have a child that comes in and it's three months old and it's underweight, um, feed the baby. The first rule is feed the baby. It doesn't matter what you feed them. Well, you have to feed it formula or, you know, or pump breast milk or something, but feed the baby. Um, and I'm going to talk in a minute about relactation and that kind of thing. But just keep in mind that the first rule is feed the baby. So if you find a severely underweight baby, this is a problem and the baby needs to get fed. And that's another rule for all of us who work in infant feeding in emergencies. And again, as I said, solids are really important. So if the baby's more than, I mean, I say seven because nobody says that, you know, the baby's going to look at the calendar and say, oh, I'm six months old today. I'll start solids today. That's not going to happen. Okay. Some babies start trying to grab their parents' food when they're five, five and a half months. Other babies aren't so interested, six, six and a half months. But by the time a baby's seven months old, it really should be getting some kind of solid food. So if it's not, um, you know, have some, have a look at what's going on there. That's a whole other field. Sometimes a baby might have a food allergy and there's a real problem. Sometimes it might just be a control issue. Maybe it's what the parents are trying to get the baby to eat and the baby doesn't like it. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe the baby has thrush or something sore in its mouth. Um, but you know, by seven months old, most children have shown interest in food and should be eating. Um, so when we do our clinics and we talk to the moms, um, you know, what do they want to know? So frankly, <laughs> they don't want a lecture on breastfeeding. That's what they don't want. They don't want someone to sit down and say, oh, you must do this and this is good for me. What they really want to, to, to know, and I'm talking about the sort of general average mom bringing her baby to see us, is, is the baby gaining weight? Is he growing or she growing? Because in the situations we work in, people don't have regular pediatric care. They're not taking their babies to the doctor's. So they don't even know what the baby's weighed. We've seen children six, seven, eight months old who've never seen any doctor. Um, and they're just, you know, looking at the baby. And 
any of you who've had children or been exposed to young children, the very, very, very first thing that the mother worries about is whether she's feeding the baby properly and if the baby's gaining weight. So that's what they want to know. And then they want to know about if the baby's growing in length. And then they want to know if the baby's developing normally and healthy. That's what they want to know. So any teaching or help or support should be really based around those principles because we're trying to do what the mother wants, right? Not what we want. We're trying to help her. Um, so this is kind of critical, all the words on this slide. So print this one out and keep it. Um, all babies lose weight in the first two to three days of life. Okay, that is completely normal. They are born with extra fluids from inside, especially if a mother's had something like a cesarean birth where she's received a lot of extra fluids during the birth process. The baby will pee off the fluids and it's completely normal for them to lose weight in the first two to three days. It's important for mothers and healthcare professionals to know that because if a doctor says to the mother on day three, oh, your baby's lost weight, then the mother's going to think, I don't have enough milk. And of course, at the beginning, she's got hardly any milk. So she's going to completely panic and think there's no milk and she's going to give it a bottle of formula. And some healthcare professionals do the same thing. It's totally normal for the baby to lose weight. However, by about day to four to five, the baby should stop losing weight and should begin gaining weight now, okay? And then by 10 days to two weeks at the most, at the most, the baby should be back to their birth weight and regularly gaining weight. So that's what happens in the first couple of weeks. By six months of age, most babies will have about doubled their birth weight. So if they're born seven pounds, they weigh 14 pounds, about three kilos, six kilos, about. And by 12 months, most babies will have roughly tripled their birth weight. Um, and we said it's normal for them to lose weight in the first few days. It's not normal for them to lose weight after the first few days. So if you have a child that's six months, seven months, eight months old, and it's losing weight, you have a problem. They're not supposed to lose weight after that. They may lose a little bit of weight if they've got a cold or they've got you know, diarrhea and they're sick. They might lose a little bit of weight over a few days or a week, but they should be growing consistently. So that's where the growth chart comes in. And this is one thing that we really insist on in our team and what we um, use to make sure that everything's going well. So growth charts are um, a personal growth record for every child that checks the work, tracks the weight and the height of the child. Boys and girls have separate charts. Um, blue for boy and pink for girl, very sexist, but very obvious. So that's fine. Premature babies have separate charts because they're born early. So their weights start out very low and they grow differently. Um, and from birth, each child should remain on their grow growth curve. It is amazing actually how a child that is fed consistently well Actually, if it's born at 50th percentile, it generally stays in the 50th percentile for its whole life. You know, the doctor can tell you how tall your three year old's going to be when it's three because it's going to stay on that same track. Um, and there are different growth charts out there, but the ones that um, are recommended were created in 2009 by the World Health Organization, uh, adopted by the American CDC in 2010. They are the gold standard. They were created by um, doing a wonderful, huge study in seven different countries tracking the growth of breastfed babies um, and to see what was normal. And they all grew the same. They were healthy babies of healthy mothers, but didn't matter where they were born, which country they were in, their growth was predictable. And so that is what they based them on, which is a good thing because before 2010, growth charts were based on formula fed babies. So it looked like breastfed babies were losing weight at certain times in their life when they actually don't, they just grow differently from formula fed babies. 98% um, of children will fall within the normal range. It is completely normal for the, for baby A to be in the 25th percentile, baby B to be in the 50th percentile, and baby C to be in the 75th, it's all normal within that 98th percent. Just because a baby is in the 10th percentile, you have a smaller child, but it doesn't mean it's, there's anything wrong. We're not trying to get babies from the 10th percentile to the 50th percentile. A child should stay on its own curve throughout its lifetime, um, and that is what is covered on the growth charts, 98% of children. Um, and you can download them uh, here um, or you can Google WHO growth charts. Um, and so these are the growth charts. So you can see here um, the part at the bottom shows the weight and the part at the top shows the length. You have, um, I can see what I'm putting on my screen here, but you have um, the age along here. So if this baby is born um, at three kilos at birth, it's going to follow this average track. So at six months, it should weigh 
um, eight kilos, okay? And, this, and then you see the height is the same. So a child at six months is going to fall within this framework. And if it, if it was born really low here, if it was born at that length, then probably at six months, it's going to be here on the chart, okay? So that's how it works. To, to give you an example of one that's plotted out here, um, this, I, I will tell you, because we're not in an interactive format, so I'll just give you the answer here. But if I, I were to ask you, this child actually is growing rather more quickly than we at all than we'd expect. So the chances are that this child was born a little bit underweight because it's sort of stabilizing here, stabilizing on the 50th percentile for height. However, you can see this baby is gaining too much weight. If I had to guess what was happening to this baby, I'd say it's being overfed because you can see it's crossing all these lines, these red dots, and it's up here, it's above the top of the chart, um, but its weight, its length is not above the top of the chart. So you've got a child here that's really too heavy for its age. It's a bit overweight. Um, we don't use the term obese until after two years old, but a baby that's overweight does have a higher chance of being overweight in the long run. So it's good to keep them um, like, you know, don't, don't feed formula and breast milk, which we'll go into in a, as well. Um, you can't overfeed a breastfed baby because everything is metabolized or excreted. You can overfeed a formula fed baby. So, um, so it, it's really critical to have a child plotted on these growth charts. It's really critical to have a weight and length on the baby. And even if you only have a birth weight, and then at weight and length today, you can learn something. It may not be, it's not perfect but it's really helpful. So I would not go and do any counseling for any child about feeding until I know where that baby falls on the growth chart. And you really, ideally you want to watch it over a couple of months to see if it's grow, getting heavy or what you hope it's not doing is, is losing weight. So if it starts out at the 50th percentile, it might be gaining weight, but it's suddenly going down to the lower curves then you have a problem with the child. If it crosses more than two of these lines or something that you don't want to happen. Um, and so to just to wrap up this first um, half of the talk, um, the other thing that the parents can worry about, of course, is development. And this can be a clue for you as well. Um, and this is a very nice chart. We use this with all the babies that we see. People just love this chart. They look at it and they say, oh, my baby can already talk and he's only five months old. I've got a very advanced baby. People really like this. Um, and we have one for older babies as well. Um, and you, it's also a good clue to you because if you do have a child who's looking a little bit off or maybe it's just a really small child, you're concerned, but if it's like running around or jumping up and down or climbing or whatever, <laughs> you know, that my parents say, oh, my baby, she, she doesn't eat anything, my two-year-old. And you're looking at this child and it's like climbing up the walls and you're like, this child looks like it's got loads of energy, must be eating something. So these developments are, these things are milestones that we call them developmental milestones. So like by two months, a child should be able to lift its head up. By four months, it should be able to push up. Um, five months, it should be able to roll over, etc. Um, some ch children do these a bit early, some do them a bit late. What you want to watch out for is to make sure that there isn't a child who is consistently missing its milestones. So it can't raise its head at two months, it can't grasp anything at three months, it can't push up at four months. If you, everything's delayed, then there's a chance that there's something wrong here that needs to be investigated by a paediatrician. Um, and that is the end of the first section of the talk. So does anybody have any questions while we switch over to the other talk? Anybody got anything they'd like to ask? You can unmute yourselves and ask if you'd like. I will go to my other talk here. Any questions? No questions. You are very, very good at it. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was. Thank you, Angelique. Well, Please feel free to ask questions, but you know I know that some people can't stay on the whole time, so I will go into the next talk. It'll get it a bit, keep it a bit shorter for you all. And if you have questions, again, you can type them into the chat, or I will stay on at the end if anyone wants to have to ask me anything else. Okay. So this one is um, a little bit more practical, although I am also going to give you a little bit of background. Um, so. One thing that we talk about a lot 
um, with infant formula is that, you know, it has a very bad history formula. I actually know a lot about the history of formula. I have a whole talk on the history of formula and it's quite interesting. And of course, as I had said, we do need formula sometimes. You, you know, babies that were orphaned um, in orphanages in the 18, early 1800s, they just all died because you can't, unless you had a woman who would breastfeed them, somebody else's baby, which raises a whole other range of questions because where is that mother's baby then? Um, unless you have someone else breastfeeding the baby, then they won't live. So there is a need for it. However, it has been marketed very aggressively and unethically um, throughout, ever since it was invented actually. Um, and this is one of the things that Nestle did that has caused huge, huge um, anger across the world against Nestle. So if you look at this picture, Nestle actually is the biggest food company in the world. Um, they not, uh, most of the companies that make formula are pharmaceutical companies or drug companies. Um, but Nestle um, is actually the biggest food company in the world. So they market their formula like they market any other food very aggressively. This picture shows um, South Africa in the 1950s. The women on the left of the screen are not nurses. They are Nestle saleswomen. Obviously, Nestle has taken people from the local population who the people will trust. They have dressed them up as nurses um, and they have put them outside the clinic, as you can see, to give out free formula. Um, there are so many things wrong with that picture that it's hard to know where to start. Um, but let's say it's extremely unethical. You know, I work with American Indians. They did the same thing on the Indian reservations. They went out there and they marketed carnation milk. They had the old elderly, the elders, the respected tribal members advertise it for them on the radio so that people would do what they said. Um, it's really quite evil formal ma formula marketing. Um, I say that with great informed I know it is and we know we know it's not ethical at all so um the, there's a very long story behind it but the WHO has a code of marketing of breast milk substitutes and the baby friendly hospital initiative both of which forbid uh, formula to be given out in the hospitals this is why those of you who work in the camps cannot give out free formula I know Sometimes you probably wish you could because after all, mothers need formula if they're not breastfeeding. However, this is where it comes from. Um, and that's why there's a restriction on formula. And sometimes I've had volunteers say to me, well, why can't, we, we know we're not supposed to give it out, but we don't know why. Well, it's because it was abused so much um, in the beginning. Um, and so at the time there was a huge national outcry, international outcry, the emphasis was mainly on Nestle and in 1981 the WHO adopted the International Code of Marketing um, and that is why we don't give out free formula. This is a picture here of one of the bags of formula that is given out regularly in American hospitals. Um, and all sorts of problems um, around that they're not supposed to do that, but they still do it. It's against the code. Um, and so hospitals can't accept free samples, promotional materials or coupons or anything else like that. And then there's something called the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, which I have spent most of my career promoting and um, operationalizing, making it happen in the United States. Um, and hospitals that are baby friendly designated, which is given out by the WHO, must pay fair market value for their formula. They must pay for it because lots of them are taking it for free from the manufacturers, which again is against the code. When we say they must pay for it, they must pay for it if they want to be baby friendly. There's no law in America that says you must pay for your formula. Um, there's no law in Greece that says you must pay for your formula. And there's only two baby friendly hospitals in Greece because most of them take it for free and they can't get designation if they take the formula for free. Um, we aren't going to go into baby friendly um, in great depth, but when I'm talking to you about some of the strategies to increase breastfeeding, a lot of them are based on the um, 10 steps to successful breastfeeding, which is what the baby friendly hospital initiative is based on. Um, and the status of baby friendly is given to birthing facilities that practice evidence based maternity care. Um, and the 10 steps to, to successful breastfeeding. Um, Atticon, I know Atticon, I know the people at Atticon Hospital is a great, it's a public hospital, but they are very supportive of breastfeeding. I know the woman that runs the unit there, they are very, very good. And Eleanor too, some of the other hospitals are much less good about it. 
This is a graphic um, which you can look at afterwards. This is the 10 steps. You can Google this. Um, this is just what the hospital says. And I'm going to, what the WHO says the hospital should be doing. I'm going to focus on a couple of these in more detail. So step three is support pregnant women. So any of you working with women who are having babies, you know that by the time the baby's two or three months old, it is even two or three weeks old, it can be too late for people to start breastfeeding or thinking about breastfeeding. Um, what you need to do, we all need to do is to support women during pregnancy. Um, that is when you can help, you know, there's no urgency, the baby's not screaming to be fed, the woman's not upset or panicking, that is when they need reassurance. Um, and you can help them ex know what to expect when they're pregnant. That will be very, very helpful when they give birth. People have all sorts of questions, which is better to answer during pregnancy than when it's too late and they've had their babies. So people say, um, you know, my breasts are small and I'm going to give you the answers. The breast size has got absolutely nothing to do with how much milk people make, um, although um, there are some women that don't develop breasts now. You probably don't know any women like that. Maybe they've had prosthetic breasts and maybe they, you know, but it's very rare. You, you, and you can see it. I mean, it's unusual. You look at a woman's chest, which you do have to do if you're breastfeeding. OK, if you're a breastfeeding helper, it's no good not watching. You have to watch the feed. Um, and you can look at the woman's chest and you can see if there's something, if she doesn't have breasts, like her chest is flat or sometimes the breast is looks very strange. It like hangs down like a long tube. Those are extremely rare cases. 90, more than 99% of women have perfectly well-formed breasts that will make milk. Okay. That is why we're mammals. Our species would have died if we didn't, weren't able to do that. How do we know we make milk? Fortunately, everybody also makes milk. I'm sure many of your mothers or grandmothers have said, I didn't make enough milk for my baby. Um, I can't make milk. In, again, in most cases, it's mismanagement. That's not to blame anybody, um, not to blame the mom. It's just that either they weren't given enough information or they were told to do it in a certain way or they, didn't, they had a lot of bottles, but the, the breastfeeding is supply and demand and people will make enough milk um, if they have, um, if they manage breastfeeding well. Will my milk be good enough? We have lots of people who are sadly told, oh, you're going to live in a camp, you're going to live in unhygienic conditions, you don't have a good diet, your milk won't be good enough, you need to give formula as well. That is absolute rubbish. Breast milk is always good. Um, there are some extreme, extreme cases, like if people are literally starving to death, um, where they don't make enough milk, but it's highly, highly unusual. Um, so almost everybody has breasts at work that make enough milk and the milk's perfectly good and it's always better than formula. Will it hurt? Again, this is a question of management. People may have not breastfed um, or seen anyone else breastfeeding before and so they don't have the baby attached to the breast correctly. And if they don't have the baby properly on the breast, then it might hurt, but it shouldn't hurt as routine. Um, and once people have learned how to do it, it won't hurt. Um, and then shall I feed breast milk and formula? I've had women say, look, I want to do the both. And that's the best thing for them because I see it on the box. You know, it says formula with extra iron. And we, we call it formula with brain, formula with DHL in it. You know, stuff that's all this stuff. Well, I can give them that as well. No, um, you don't need to give both. It's not better to give both. It's better to only give breast milk. Um, because as we said before, with formula, not only are you giving them stuff they don't need, um, but you're also exposing them to feeding methods that might well cause disease, you know, not clean water, not clean bottles, bacteria in the formula, bacteria in the water, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So what can we do to get ready? Really, um, there's nothing new. you don't need to sort of toughen up the nipples. People say, oh, go rub your nipples with a rough towel. That, no, you don't need to do anything. Your nipples would be perfectly OK. Um, women excrete an oil which lubricates the area around the nipple. You don't need to do anything at all. Um, the breast should grow in pregnancy because of the hormonal changes. The breast will get bigger. Um, again, unless there's some very unlikely people who have um, not got 
have had something wrong with the breast. By the way, surgery, breast reduction or breast augmentation surgery can also mess with breastfeeding. Um, probably, and I'm being, I'm being very generalized here, but that's probably, well, I haven't seen that as much as a problem here as we see in the United States where people have had surgery, either cosmetic or to relieve very bad back pain from very heavy breasts. So surgery can be an issue. But if everything is normal, um, the breasts will get larger during pregnancy. By the way, that's another reason to look at a woman's breasts because if she's had surgery, she might not tell you, but you'll be able to see. Um, and then of course, birth triggers a dramatic change in the mother's hormone levels. Um, and the, the body begins to milk, make milk when the baby's born. That is what triggers it. The, the prolactin and oxytocin uh, come, uh, rise and those are the hormones that make the milk be made. So prolactin is what makes the milk and oxytocin is what ejects the milk. Um, if you've ever seen anybody breastfeed, it's not just the baby sucking the milk out. The breast actually contracts and pushes the milk out as well. It's the same contract like you have contractions during labor. It's the same action. So when they're pregnant, what you can do to help them um, is to help their diet. This again, it won't affect the baby very much, but it will affect the woman. She needs to be as healthy as she can uh, to have this big effort of giving birth and supporting children and everything. So um, the healthier the diet, the better. Anemia is the biggest problem in the world for pregnant women. So anything that's got iron in it, like lentils or you know, meats or anything. I know meats are expensive. Lentils are great. Apri dried apricots, things with iron in them. Even if you can only give them as a small supplement, that's good. Um, and you can get um, pills for women. If you really fear that a woman has a terrible diet, like just deprived diet, some of these things are actually beneficial, especially vitamin D, iron. Um, you have to be careful because um, of things like um, constipation with iron, but most pregnant women will benefit if they don't have a good diet from a supplement that gives them for themselves a better, a better profile. Um, Sadly, this does not always happen, but if you can help advocate for people that in the 50s and 60s, and I'm afraid still in Greece in many places, the babies are automatically simply taken away and put in a nursery. Why is that? Because in the 50s and 60s, everybody was having general anesthesia for births. Many, many people had general anesthesia. It was thought to be the great painkiller of its day. Hooray, women don't have to go through labor. And then the boy baby's born and the mother cannot possibly take care of the baby if she's under general anesthesia. So then all the babies went off to the nursery and they were all put in rows like little soldiers and fed routinely and taken out to the mother sometimes and etc. And that is where our strange hospital practices come from. The routines of the hospital, not the routines that work or non-routines that work for moms and babies. What we do um, in the baby friendly hospitals is that when the baby is born, the baby is placed skin to skin with the mother on the mother's chest at least for an hour. Where do we get the hour from? Babies are just like any other mammal. If you have a new mammal of any kind and you don't mess with it, it will get to the mother's nipple on its own. It will either crawl there, stand up to get there. You watch any mammal being born, getting it attaches to the nipple. And some mammals actually have to go through that pro process. Just like when a butterfly comes out of a chrysalis, if it doesn't work to get out, it won't ever be able to fly. Some mammals actually have to go through the process of getting to the breast or the nipple to the milk and actually newborn babies are the same. So the baby will crawl. I don't know if everyone's seen this, it's one of the most touching things. If you leave the baby on the mother's chest for an hour or her belly, it will crawl on its own and self attached to the breast. And it takes usually about an hour for that to happen. So that is why we give it an hour. Um, you can do cesarean skin to skin as well, just needs the hospital to be um, on board with it and do it. Um, and mother and baby should be covered by a warm blanket. The mother's skin will keep the baby warm, but cover the back of the baby with the blanket um, and monitor them because we don't just put them on the mother's skin and then go off and you know have a beer or something. Um, we're still monitoring moms and babies in case there's that strange chance where there's something going wrong with the mom and baby. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this drives me 
mad. I mean, we, we just knew this was going to happen. Those of us who are breastfeeding experts, the minute we get COVID, everybody says, oh, you know, you can't, you shouldn't breastfeed, something might happen. And the World Health Organization, God love them, they came out with this poster and right at the beginning, because they knew that it was far more dangerous for women not to breastfeed than it was to try and prevent a bit of COVID in babies. By the way, children and babies rarely, rarely, rarely have any kind of severe disease. Um, and as you've probably seen in the news now, oh, lo and behold, breast milk passes the antibodies and protects them and in pregnancy and in, you know, we, we, we knew that not because we're just breastfeeding knots, but because we actually knew that because that's what happens with almost every other virus. It's protective. Um, and I can do a whole talk on that too. But basically you want moms and babies to be together and skin to skin. Um, and that will actually protect the baby against COVID and anything else that's going around the hospital. Because, of course, you don't want the hospital, the baby in the hospital corridors or the nursery with loads of other babies. Somebody might have COVID and they catch it from them. So they're much better to be with the mothers. Um, as we said, skin to skin is normal for all mammals. They can put them on, on the chest and should stay there for an hour. Um, I said that already. Some of the benefits of skin to skin. First of all, it keeps the baby warm. If you take the baby and put it in a hospital nursery and leave it there and then give it a bath, and it starts screaming, it gets cold, it's glycemia, it gets hypoglycemic, its sugar levels go down because it's using so much energy to scream and cry that it can't um, control its sugar levels. And then its sugar levels go down. Now you have a feeding problem. Now you have a baby that can't, that has to get formula because it's got low glycemic levels. That's because you just did all that stuff to it. If you leave it with a mother and keep it on her chest, it will decrease the baby's risk of getting cold. It will decrease the risk of hypoglycemia. It will keep the glucose levels high. It keeps the baby and the mother, by the way, calm. It stabilizes the heart rate and the breathing. It prevents pain in mom. You may think I'm crazy, but no, we did a study at our hospital where we did some of the baby's first heel stick, the shots that they get at the beginning for the test while the baby was breastfeeding and the baby actually didn't feel the pain, it blocked, the breastfeeding blocks the pain. Um, and also it is, um, helps the baby to attach and it improves breast, um, the breastfeeding rates going forward as well. So it's all good skin to skin, it's all good. Um, and you can see some pictures here of mothers with skin to skin. Um, that one on the left of your screen is a cesarean birth. Um, and the one on the right, dad. So if the mother is ill, sometimes if moms, especially if they have a cesarean, they might vomit or not be well afterwards. The, the dad's really good at heating up the baby too. It's kind of interesting. They did do some study with moms and dads and they found that mothers were better regulators of temperature. Um, the dads just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter and the babies get hotter and hotter and hotter. Whereas with the moms, they, they tend to be, uh, if the baby gets hot, the mom's skin cools down. Um, but dads are fine. I mean, let dads do skin to skin. That's great as well. And it's great for bonding with the dad. Um, some of you may have heard of the kangaroo mother care programs in some developing nations, some low income countries. Um, Peru, I believe, is where it started. Um, so if a baby is born premature in a country where they do not have reliable access to incubators, et cetera, et cetera, the child is much more likely to survive if they go into kangaroo care. And it is really kangaroo care. It's the image of a kangaroo. This baby may be born at, you know, two or three pounds. And they are strapped to the mother, skin to skin. Um, they can get their arm out, that helps them to regulate the temperature. But they're right next to the breast and they can be in that position for months. They're taught to keep the baby in that position for like until it's due date. Um, it keeps the baby warm. It keeps them you know, the, away from the risk of infections, et cetera. And it's very effective. It's used very widely um, in developing in lower middle income countries where they don't have um, access to electric incubators and it's used in countries where they do have access to incubators when the mothers are in the nurse the NICU the intensive care unit um, skin to skin is the preferred way of keeping them some hospitals you know, Scandinavia does everything perfectly they're just perfect in Scandinavia and um, they have skin to skin care for very very tiny babies um, around the clock they house the parents in the um, intensive care unit so they can give skin to skin um, so as for the newborns, remember that they will lose a little bit of weight and mothers don't make very much milk at the beginning. They make something called colostrum or liquid gold. It's, it can be um, gold. It can be clear. Sometimes mother thinks it's water because there's no color to it. 
um, but no colostrum is absolutely vital. It is very rich in nutrients and white blood cells. Um, and that is what the mothers have at the beginning. If you, especially if you have a mother who um, is trying to get milk with a pump or something, they can be very distressed at the beginning because they don't see any milk. But actually the baby will only takes a very little bit, bit of milk at the beginning. On day one of life, the baby's tummy is only the size of a cherry, it's tiny. They do not need very much milk. Um, one to one and a half teaspoons of milk, that's all they need at the beginning. Um, it's very, very rich. Um, and sometimes, you know, mothers imagine their baby's stomach is, you know, the size of a football and that they can't possibly get enough milk um, into the baby. But it's, it's almost negligible, the volume at the beginning. They don't really need anything for the first couple of days. I mean, they have to feed, but they don't need a large volume of milk. Um, on the first day, as we said, it's about a tablespoon of milk the whole day. Um, and there are 10 million white blood cells in each feed. Talk about the immune system. When the milk comes in, which is about day three of the baby's life, day three postpartum, then you suddenly have the opposite problem. Instead of mom, mom thinking, oh my God, I have no milk. Suddenly she's got so much milk. She doesn't know what to do with. She might wake up from a nap or something and suddenly she's got these huge breasts full of milk and they can be really hard and they have to um, feed frequently. Otherwise they will get very engorged. This is especially true for the first baby. Um, so they should feed frequently to avoid engorgement. And if for some reason the milk doesn't come in like that, they should be checked. There can be reasons like retained placenta or not feeding enough why the milk didn't come in. Um, but it will come in usually. It's most obvious in a first time mother, you get much more dramatic <laughs> increase in the milk. When the, we've had two or three babies, it's not quite as noticeable when it comes in. Um, the baby needs to be properly attached to the breast. This is really important. We say it's like this baby's eating a hamburger. You need the, the baby needs to go on here and really um, attach the breast like this, okay? Um, if it's not latched on properly, it won't get enough milk. Um, and if the milk isn't transferred, then it's, it's going to hurt the mom. So you'll know if the baby's not latched on properly because it's really going to hurt and the mother's milk supply is going to suffer. So it needs to be well latched on um, and the infant's weight should be monitored and charted on growth charts. Um, so I see Sally just joined. We, I think we might be an hour across Sally. We've been doing the training for a while, but we can send you the recording of the first part of it. So um, yeah, so it will, you need to make sure, you see this picture here of this baby, um, it has nice flanged lips, we say like fish lips, both of the lips are turned outward as it attaches onto the breast, so it has a really good grasp on the breast and it's not hurting. Sometimes the lip at the bottom can be turned underneath and that can be very painful for the mother. Um, and so you need to ensure it's it's latched on properly. Um, if it's not, then you have pain and not transfer of milk and it won't get anything. Um, lovely pictures here. So when you have a baby, some women are very surprised to see that the, when the baby poops the first couple of days, it's like this thick black tarry stuff that we call meconium. Um, and that is completely normal. That comes from all the stuff that the baby's been swallowing when it's in utero. But a breastfed baby um, by about day three of life should have a bright yellow soft poop. And that's what this looks like in the other diaper. If you have a mom, by the way, just an inside tip. If you have a mom who tells you she's exclusively breastfeeding and you have green smelly or brown stool that looks more like an adult stool, then she's not exclusively breastfeeding or there's something really wrong because all breastfed babies, the time they only have breast milk, the stool always looks yellow and it's like yogurt. It's kind of like yogurty. It's not even that awful. Um, so when the babies, that we're talking really here about the first day of life, the first week of life, sorry. So babies should pee and poop frequently. This is the one single most straightforward way to know if the baby is getting in off in week one of life, okay? There should be pooping and peeing frequently. Um, they might not start very much, start out very well, but yeah, they're soon gonna get there. So the first day they should have a couple of those sticky black poops. By, about, by day three, they should have about three days, three poops, and by day four, they should have about four poops and the poop should be yellow by then, okay? Um, it's sometimes difficult to tell if the baby is peeing 
Um, but you can, if you're worried that it's dehydrated or something, you can put like a tissue inside the diaper to see if it gets wet because the diapers are very absorbent. Um, they should eat eight to 12 times in 24 hours. We do not, there's no such thing as scheduling. They can space those feeds. They may sleep longer or shorter times in between, but about eight to 12 times in 24 hours, not like we used to say every three hours. Every three hours is uh, old fashioned hospital routine stuff. Um, we don't say that because you know what happens if you're the nurse or the doctor and you say, oh, feed your baby every three hours, the mother will listen to you guys. You're really, really critical people. They will listen to you and they will look at their watch and the baby will be crying at two hours and they'll say, oh, he can't be hungry because the doctor said he's only eating every three hours. What's wrong with him? Well, it's normal for them to have different spaces between their feeds. Um, and so don't say every three hours, every eight to 12 times in 24 hours. The other thing we don't say is 10 minutes on each breast. We used to say that, we don't say that anymore. Um, the baby regulates its intake. Some babies eat quickly, some babies eat slowly. The way you will know if it's going okay is that the baby is booing and peeing frequently, okay? The pee should be clear or yellow. You can see the picture here on there. This is showing something called uric acid crystals. If the baby has peed, and it's not got enough fluid, it comes out as like uric acid, it's orange crystals in the diaper. That's a danger sign. I will just mention while you're looking at this lovely picture of a diaper, that sometimes little baby girls will have bleeding like as if they had a tiny period. That is to do with the mother's hormones at birth. It's not, it's quite scary to people. It's not abnormal. It goes away within the first day or so, but you do sometimes have a little bit of blood from the from a baby girl. Um, but the but the acid, the the urine should not look like crystals. You don't want a baby that's dehydrated. Um, so signs of problems in week one, and I, you know, I, we all, I'm focusing on how breastfeeding is normal, healthy, and everything should be going well. So this is the exception. However, because we know that many of these babies are not seeing doctors, um, it's important for anyone that works in this context to be able to spot problems, which is why I'm mentioning them. So orange crystals in the diaper can be a problem. An older baby that is skinny, we had a terrible case of this in one of the camps recently, very, very, very sick child that many doctors had seen, said it was okay, it weighed three and a half kilos and it was 10 months old. You will see a child like that, you know there's something wrong with that child. It looked, even at like two or three months, if they haven't gained weight, you know what a, a baby, a classic baby looks like, they're sort of chubby and they've got a round face and they've got chubby little arms. Children that are underweight, they look like chickens. They look like, you know, a chicken that you're going to put in the oven with skinny, skinny parts. You, you shouldn't look like that. You should look chubby. Once it, It's skinny when it's first born. Newborns are thin, but they gain weight quickly and they should look chubby. If mother has fever or pain in the breast, she usually don't get this at the beginning, but they could get an infection. Um, another sign of problem is if the baby is lethargic. If people say, oh, I've got a good sleepy baby, this we, we should say, oh dear, we have a problem here. Babies are not supposed to be sleepy or good. They're supposed to wake up to feed. If it's not, and you can get into a very bad cycle with a baby that is maybe a little bit premature or just a sleepy baby, doesn't wake up and then it sometimes mother's giving it a pacifier and it's sucking on the pacifier all the time and it's not eating instead it's using its energy to suck on the pacifier um, that's a problem you want a child that's demanding to be fed that's saying it's hungry that's showing feeding cues like sucking on its hand turning its head making noises um, a child that is not eating at least eight times in 24 hours and is always asleep is is a problem okay don't listen to parents that tell you I have got a good baby babies aren't supposed to be good um a baby that's I, I don't listen to parents that's really awful I always say you should always listen to everything the parents say but sometimes they are sort of tuned to think that a baby should be good and shouldn't make a noise so in that case don't listen to them by the way to the other thing to listen and another sign of problem is if a mother or a father say something has changed they know their babies if something has changed if it was actually a calm baby and now it's irritable or vice versa that's also a sign that something's not great um, if the baby is yellow in the few days after birth um, that can be jaundice you can see it if you can't see it on the skin you can see it often on the whites of their eyes that can be yellowish that can be a problem um, that means they may not be eating enough breast milk 
you just need to keep feeding them a lot. Um, the more they poop that yellow stuff out, the more they get rid of all that extra bilirubin. So, but you just want to watch for that. If a baby gets very yellow, there's a problem. Again, a sudden change in behavior. Um, and if the baby, as we said before, is not on its growth curve or it's losing weight. Um, some babies are high risk. I would say that most of the babies that we see here are high risk, almost all of them, because they haven't had prenatal care and they don't have regular follow-up. That's automatically high risk, okay? Um, but babies that are born before 38 weeks are higher risk. They may be particularly sleepy. They may be the ones that are good and calm and don't latch on properly. Um, also, some babies are born slightly underweight. Um, you know, mom's nine months pregnant, you would expect her baby to weigh, give or take three, three and a half kilos. If the baby's much smaller than that, even though the mother has gone to term, um, there could have been some problem. We call it interuterine growth retardation. And you have a baby that's small for gestational age. Similarly, those babies are more um, prone to not feeding well or getting jaundice. Obviously, you can have children with physical issues like cleft lip or palate. That is when there has a, you can see a cleft lip. It's obvious. It's a big gap in the lip. Occasionally, babies have a cleft palate, which is the roof of the mouth, um, and they don't have a cleft lip. So people don't see, they can't see. These are rare, guys. These are rare, but these are high risk babies. It's more difficult for them to feed. It's easier for them to use the breast because they can... The breast is so soft that the, the breast can be shaped to fill the cleft and create, create suction. But those babies do find it hard to suck because they don't create suction because there's a hole in the in the lip or the, the mouth. Um, tongue tie, you hear a lot of talk about tongue tie these days. In my opinion, it's somewhat overdiagnosed, but occasionally you can have a baby that has um, the frenulum, which is that thing that holds your tongue to the bottom of your mouth put your finger under your tongue, you'll feel your frenulum. Um, if those are very hard and thick, then sometimes um, the baby's tongue is, is, is not able to move properly on the bottom of the breast and that can be a problem. And then, as I say, everybody else that you see who's not getting regular prenatal care and not getting doctors to see them. So we, we, we mentioned briefly about um, supply and demand, right? So, uh, and not making enough milk. And so many women thinking they don't make enough milk. Um, so remember that it's supply and demand. That means that the more the baby eats, the more milk the mother will make. That's it, that is really simple. That's what happens, okay? So obviously if they're not feeding, they won't make milk. I mean, if a mother doesn't feed her baby at all with breast milk, then the milk dries up. The body assumes the baby died and there's no baby to feed and the body stops producing milk, okay? Um, if a mother has twins, she can make enough milk for twins. Um, she may have to <laughs> spend a great deal of time feeding them, but she will double her output, just like other mammals that can have a litter that's one, two, three, four, five, six. They adapt to make the right amount of milk for the right amount of babies. Um, and I only in extreme circumstances like starvation do women not make enough milk. So if you have a woman who's telling you she's not making enough milk, you know, listen and be empathetic and but but most of the time it's going to be most likely because she's giving bottles frankly most likely because she's giving bottles um, and that means that if you give half half the feeds with formula and half the feeds with your breast then you make half as much milk it's supply and demand okay um so it's important to feed when the baby's hungry, not to have routines. If they're feeding every four hours, they won't be making enough milk. And then of course, the other reason people think they don't have enough milk is because unfortunately, the doctor told them they're not going to make enough milk. Or somebody said, um, you know, oh, your baby's lost a bit of weight in the first two days, you better supplement. Or, I mean, this happens all the time. All the time, healthcare professionals tell women, you're not making enough milk. You won't do any harm. Just give it a few, bit, a few bottles or top up after the end of the feed. You know, I can't emphasize enough that you just don't need to do that. You may need to increase the number of breastfeeds sometimes if the baby's not getting enough, but the body will react and make more milk. So if instead of, you know, feeding the baby a little bit longer, you give it an ounce of formula after the feed, then that's an ounce of milk that the mother won't make. And so they get into the cycle of making less and less milk. Um, and, you know, it's been very common for our mothers or our grandmothers to say, oh, I didn't make enough milk for you. And people think it like runs in the family. But you must remember that the family would be dead if that was really the case, because if our great, great, great grandmothers hadn't made enough milk for us, nobody would have survived. So it doesn't really run in families. Um, 
And so other people say, well, in their culture, people are breastfeeding. Um, no one culture is consistent. So, you know, it, <laughs> Americans often say, well, what do they do in Europe? I'm like, well, which bit of Europe are you talking about? Sweden, Greece, Spain, Germany, everywhere is different. It's like that in the United States as well. What do they do in America? Well, it depends. If you live in California and you're really cool and you wear, you know, open-toed sandals, you're most likely to breastfeed. Everyone tolerates breastfeeding in public. Um, people have a problem the breastfeeding rates in California are really really high if you live in Mississippi where and I'm I'm quoting directly people say black women don't breastfeed there's nothing more likely to make me go through the roof but people say that all the time they say about all cultures frankly but women Hispanic women always do both breastfeeding and bottle feeding Native American women don't breastfeed it's absolute garbage but they say that and there's a prejudice and people get embarrassed um, if that happens um, people you know, tend not to breastfeed and then people aren't, you know, breastfeeding in public, etc. So it, it can be very um, dependent on where they live. And that goes for all countries. People living in the city might be doing differently than people living in the rural area. Either way, pro or con. Um, Another thing that's quite interesting is, you know, we think of how healthy breast milk is, right? I mean, really, guys, breast milk is just food. I mean, it's food. You know, when we, all this stuff about disasters, everybody knows that in a disaster, it's really important to feed people, but they tend to forget that it's really important to breastfeed the babies in, you know, in some of the camps and things. It's just food. And, and, and in places where people actually do breastfeed all the time, they don't always think it's healthy. They just think the feed, you know, they're feeding the baby. So, your argument that you should do this because it's healthier for the baby often doesn't make sense to people. They're like, well, you know, I'm just feeding my baby. What do you mean it's healthier, healthier than what? So people don't always do it as a health related behavior, even though in some of our cultures, we've learned that it's the healthiest thing. And that's why we try to do it. It's not always considered healthy or not healthy. It's just feeding. So um, stress or depression, people may um, think they can't make enough milk or good milk. Um, if you've never succeeded at anything or you're depressed, you know, I've had several refugee women say, well, I, I can't possibly make good milk. I, you know, I can't do anything right. I can't make good milk. Um, and then, of course, there is a time commitment. I saw one woman in Greece um, who she had her ninth baby and she breastfed all the other eight. And she said, I, I just can't, I've got four children here with me and they're all under six and I can't possibly, I don't have time. And I just looked at the dad, I'm like, please just do the, the childcare where you can, because if this mom doesn't breastfeed, you're going to spend a lot more time going to the doctor. Um, but it is an issue, you know, it's not easy to take care of four children and breastfeed, but it's probably going to be a better idea than not breastfeeding, I have to say. For those women who do feed formula, um, you know, it's important for us as healthcare providers, especially if we are the people that are helping them to feed the baby, because we've seen it, we've given them cans of formula because they're not feed, breastfeeding and the baby's four months old and they don't have anything else. Um, you must know how to prepare it. Do not ever give a woman a can of powdered formula and expect her to know what she's doing, okay? There's no way she's going to be able to read that can, know how much to give it, anything. You have to sit down with her and help her learn how to make the formula. So she needs a clean environment. You must teach the basics, wash the hands before preparing it, sterilize the bottles, which means boiling the bottles. If you tell them this during pregnancy, people do get, tend to get the idea that maybe this is, maybe they'll breastfeed after all. Um, boil the water. And the WHO actually recommends against powdered formula, but nobody can afford even powdered formula. And the ready-made stuff is extremely expensive and not even very common in most countries. So we do have it in America. You can go buy ready-made, um, but not much. It's not very common. Um, again, this goes back to what we said at the beginning, if it is made, formula should be kept in the fridge at least 24 hours, no more. Um, it lasts about 24 hours. If it's at room temperature, you should throw it out after an hour. If the baby didn't finish it, you should not reuse it because if the baby's been sucking on the nipple, then the enzymes are going to get into the milk or the bacteria, whatever. You don't want to reuse it. Um, the WHO actually recommends recommends cup feeding not bottle feeding it is very difficult to clean a bottle and a nipple properly um, cups are much easier to clean and actually newborn babies can 
sip from cops, they actually lap it up like a kitten. So you can cop feed a baby. Um, and that's what the WHO recommends. But in this culture here now in Greece, don't see many people cop feeding. If they are bottle feeding, don't prop the baby up with the bottle. That's something else you see busy moms and I have seen busy volunteers do. You put the baby on the sofa, you wrap it all up with its bottle and you stick the bottle in its mouth and you leave it. This baby's going to choke. Don't do that. It's very dangerous. OK, they don't have to move their heads enough to do that. You have to hold the baby if you're going to bottle feed it. So at this point, people usually say, oh, well, can we, how can we, can we get them, if, you know, if they've been bottle feeding and it's that dreadful, um, how can we get them to go back and breastfeed instead? So this is a field called relactation, okay? Which means that going back to breastfeeding after feeding formula or after not breastfeeding, actually grandmas have been known to like relactate if there's a desperate situation and they put the baby to the breast enough, they often will make milk if they've had children. Um, and it technically is possible, but there are many bots and I'm very conservative about recommending relactation and I'll tell you why. Yes, the baby sucking at the best breast will make more milk and that's what, what to do. And if she's going to relactate, she should be feeding the baby all the time at the breast, like, you know, pacifying the baby, having the baby next to her in the bed, feeding the baby all the time and expressing milk as well, because again, it's supply and demand. So the more she takes out of the milk, the breast, the more she's going to make. So she needs to do that all the time, okay? But there's a few things, a, a few big bots here. First of all, it depends how old the baby is. So if you have a baby that's a few days old and the mother hasn't breastfeed it or a couple of weeks old and it's been getting too many bottles, chances are if the mom breastfeeds and breastfeeds and breastfeeds, she'll rev up her milk supply and she'll be fine. But you know, if you, a baby comes to you and you've not seen it before and it's three months old and it hasn't breastfed, the chances of that child, of that mother making the milk are very slim. Maybe she could if she spent her whole life devoted to doing that. Um, but of course, there's a reason she's bottle feeding in the first place, right? So whatever it was that stopped her from breastfeeding at the beginning, now she's going to have to be 10 times more dedicated to try and bring the milk back. And she, you need to follow the baby. You can't tell to somebody in a camp, go and breastfeed, it's much better for you, and then not see them again for two months because you've no idea if that baby's gaining weight or if the mother um, really did relactate. So be very, very careful before you recommend like, relactation. You need to know exactly how much formula the baby's getting. If you've got a really healthy growing big baby and it's getting one bottle of formula a day, you can safely say, get rid of that bottle, mom, you know, over the next week, give it less and less milk in that bottle and just more breast. That's fine. But if a baby's half breast, half bottle, you can't, it's very, very risky to do that in the circumstances. Just a word about um, contraindications. There are a few rare circumstances where babies should not be breastfed. The only infant cause is a, a, a metabolic disorder called galactosemia, where the baby can't um, can't digest the milk. In in real, you know, in the past, those babies would have died. It's a very rare genetic disorder. They can make um, pre-digested formulas that will feed those babies um, under careful and close supervision. But galactosemia is the only contraindication for. Um, uh, a baby. There is no other reason a baby can't breastfeed. Um, the mother, if now this is a very hot field, or HIV, um, when we again, like COVID, when HIV came out at the beginning, we said, don't breastfeed. You know, we've seen babies catch HIV through breast milk. It's true, it has happened. Okay. What's really going on there? The baby is getting um, the HIV through the breast milk, but if you exclusively breastfeed that baby and you give it no formula, then the chances of the baby catching HIV are zero at that time. However, however, very few women exclusively breastfeed to that extent. So what you get is a mother who's breastfeeding most of the time, but giving some something else other times. The something else damages the gut and the HIV gets in through the gut. So exclusive 100% shear breastfeeding is protective, but because most people unfortunately are not actually doing that, um, the WHO recommends if the mother has access to clean water, then if she's HIV positive, she doesn't breastfeed. However, access to clean water most people don't have. So most people should actually breastfeed even if they have HIV. The chance of the baby dying from a diarrheal related um, 
infection is worse than the baby getting HIV. Um, and if the mother's being medicated and closely monitored, it's actually relatively safe. And then there's another strange thing is she gets T-cell lymphocytic virus type one, she shouldn't breastfeed, that's also rare. Um, Ebola is contraindicated if it's confirmed, it's a tricky area. Vaccinations can make people think they've got Ebola, they don't necessarily have it, so it's a tricky area, it needs to be carefully evaluated. Untreated brucellosis, again, these are all very, very rare. Um, herpes is not that rare. You do not want the child to come into contact with any kind of herpes sores on the breast, okay? Children have died from that. You have to be really careful. If the other breast has no, no lesions, um, you can have the baby breastfeed. It's not something coming through the milk. It's the exposure of the baby's mouth to a herpes sore on the breast that is dangerous. So you've got to be really careful with that. And then many um, street drugs are contraindicated like cocaine. You don't want to breastfeed on cocaine, you'll kill the baby. Um, she can stop feeding temp at the breast, but pump or express milk if she's got untreated active tuberculosis. Once she's treated and it's no longer active, she can keep breastfeeding. Um, if she's got active chickenpox infection, again, this is to do with the transmission of the infection to the baby through the mother's contact, um, but that mother can pump and not have immediate contact with the baby. Now, this brings me to the whole thing of taking medicine. Okay, this is a very specialist area, so we're not going to go into this um, in great depth. However, it's worth remembering that when the mother's pregnant, the medicine goes to the baby's bloodstream through the placenta, it goes into the baby. So you've got a pretty direct route of transmission there. But if when a mother's breastfeeding, there are quite a lot of things that actually have to happen before anything she eats or takes um, gets to the baby. So first of all, the, the medication has to be absorbed into the mother's bloodstream. Then it has to get out of the mother's bloodstream into the milk and the milk has to go into the baby's mouth and then the baby has to absorb the milk and then the drug has to go into the baby's bloodstream. That's a fairly protective system for a lot of things. Um, if the mother um, is no longer, it's general anaesthetic is my best example. If the mother is not, it has a general anaesthetic and then she wakes up, she can breastfeed the baby. They always tell you to pump and dump. They did that with me once, you don't need to. There's no general anesthetic in the mother anymore or she'd be asleep still, so she can breastfeed. So once it's cleared the mother's system, it's not sitting there waiting for baby, ambushing the baby, although fat soluble is a little bit different. So the, the, the medication gets into the milk by passive diffusion. So it goes through the blood supply to the uh, alveo alveoli in the breast where the milk is made. And there are lots of things that impact that transfer. So a drug that has, actually, I can't, I don't know if I've gone, uh, yeah, um, sorry. So if, if it's um, a heavy, a big molecule, like insulin, for example, insulin cannot get into the milk. It's a really big molecule, it just never goes in. So you don't, you can have as much insulin as you like in the mother, it, it won't go to the baby, okay? And then the other things are half-life of the drug, whether it's actually available through the oral route. If you have to inject it because you can't absorb it through your stomach, then the child's like unlikely to absorb it through their stomach, et cetera. And fat solubility, the stuff that is fat soluble tends to get more concentrated in the milk because there's a lot of fat in the milk. Um, so like if um, a drug has a long half life, that means that the mother takes something like a flu medication that's supposed to last 24 hours then the whole purpose of that is for the drug to last a long time in the mother's system. So if she's taken a medicine that's lasting 24 hours, it's going to be in her milk for 24 hours. So that has a higher chance of getting into the baby than something that only lasts two hours, which is then gone from the mother's system. Um, and if drug builds up in the mother, then it can become trapped. So Drugs with a short half-life are preferred. So take something like ibuprofen that, you know, only lasts two to four hours instead of taking a 24-hour flu medication to feel better if you're the mother. Um, in terms of when she should breastfeed. So if the mother breastfeeds, takes the medication that only stays in her system for two hours and then breastfeeds three after three hours, again, the milk will be gone. The, sorry, the, the drug will be gone from the milk. So mothers should take the medication right before they breastfeed, then they should breastfeed, and then the, the system will be cleared after that. So you, those are, these are ways that you can manage medication in milk. Um, older babies process milk medicines better in the milk. So like you have a six month old baby or a seven month old baby that's eating some solids, 
Um, it's got a mature digestive system. It's good at excreting things itself. Um, that is much less vulnerable to a medication than a new baby or a premature baby who's feeding all the time and who may not have a developed system to excrete things properly yet the, you know the livers and the kidneys and everything are still developing so it's much more likely that a drug is fine with an older baby than with a very young or especially a premature baby antibiotics are very common not just in mothers right in babies too so anything that you can give a baby you can get you can give a mother if a baby can have that antibiotic then the mother can certainly have the antibiotic without impacting um, the baby, yes, it will pass into the milk, but the dose is very small by the time it gets to the baby and the antibiotics safe for the baby, then it's not a problem. Um, so most antibiotics most of the time are fine for breastfeeding women. And there's a couple of sources here that you can use to look at for, lacta for information on lactation and dress breastfeeding. So Lactamed is the United States breast milk repository for anything you want to find out about breastfeeding and medicines. Um, it's great. It will have every study that's ever published. You go to the link, you put in um, the name of the medication, it comes up with a list of stuff. And then the European one, which is based in Spain, is elactancia.org. So these are both great sources. You don't need to know. Nobody needs to know if someone shows up with a medicine and says, can I take this medicine? Nobody is expected to know, right? But you can't, you should know where to go to look. Um, and these are reliable sources. And as I've said a million times, don't guess. Okay, if I can leave you with one thought, don't guess. I mean, people tend to guess conservatively. They say, oh, don't breastfeed and, you know, don't, just take the medicine, but just don't guess. If you don't know the answer to something, look it up, find out, ask somebody else who does know, don't guess and don't give the mother wrong information because we're very, we wield a lot of power. I mean, some of us are healthcare professionals, some of us are not, but we're, we're treating very vulnerable people. We're, many of us are white. They look at us and they think we know things, which is terrible state of affairs, but unfortunately it's true. Um, we are affluent, organized, free to travel people. Um, they are very much the refugees in a very vulnerable position. And if you tell them something, chances are, chances are they'll take you seriously. Um, so please just don't ever guess. I think that's it. Yes. So um, non-exclusive breastfeeding uh, is, and I don't know what that is, an emergency. I don't know what that, sorry, that first bullet point's odd. Um, infants should be exclusively breastfed for six months. And when you breastfeed, you're basically giving a medicine that will, at least for the first six months of the baby's life, protect and insulate it from extreme conditions. I think what uh, my first bullet point is supposed to say, non-exclusive breastfeeding is an emergency, okay? If you're not, you're already creating an emergency situation for a child if you're not breastfeeding exclusively in these conditions. So I think that is it. And I do thank you all for um, your time. I don't know if anyone has put in any, oh, we've got something in the chat, I think. Okay, great, here we go. <laughs> don't worry, Sally, that's okay. We'll send you the first part. We'll put this, um, we'll, if anybody wants um, the recording, um, Rana, can you type your email? into the chat runner please and anyone that wants their um the recording can email us and most of you have our um contact information through um whatsapp as well so you can get in touch with them we'll, we'll just send me an email i prefer to do it by email because i'm so old email is easier for me than um attaching things to whatsapp but we can send you a link okay so um somebody asked here what is a safe worth weight loss at birth um, 10 percent was did used to be given as a safe birth weight loss um, some places are now saying seven, ten, seven to ten percent sorry I've been talking for two hours I'm tired seven to ten percent um, we did a study in my hospital we did it I authored it um, looking at weight loss in a baby friendly hospital and we actually found that babies lost a little bit less weight um, pr probably because they were given immediate access to the breast not put in a nursery and not given access to the breast. So um, seven to 10 percent. There's no really good study showing how much weight child, a child can lose um, in ideal circumstances or not. But seven to 10 percent. And as, as we said before, um, if the baby was born by cesarean, it's probably going to lose a little bit more weight because it's got more fluid in the first place. 
Um, see what other question. Uh, okay, how long exclusive for breastfeeding if HIV positive? To be absolutely honest, I haven't really looked and the guidelines change. It used to be exclusive for six months and then wean quickly because it's that period where they get both breast milk and something else when um, it's dangerous. So the, the recommendation was quick weaning. Um, but guys, the, the research on HIV is kind of changing all the time and they've done a lot of studies in Africa. So um, I don't know if that's ethical, but it's true. They can study it in Africa because they just can. And also because it's so endemic there in the population, there's so many people have it. So there's a lot of work. So I, I won't guess either. I don't remember the most recent information off the top of my head, but there's definitely a lot of work out there that's being done and it's changing all the time, the recommendations, which also, by the way, guys, is really important thing to know. It, it's um, very important to realize that most of what you're being taught now, um, and we say that they say this in medical school, half of what you're being taught now is correct. Half of it's going to be outdated, but we don't know which half. So you have to keep up with the literature. You have to keep up with everything in order to know what's actually updated, what's actually out of date and what's changed since you were educated five years ago. So, or 10 years ago or 30 years ago, depending on who we are. Um, any other questions, people? You can open your mics up. Um, we went through that fairly fast. And I do have, I mean, you guys can ask me if you want any more information. We have loads of trainings. I mean, really, this was just scratching the surface. There's all sorts of other things like about breast problems or um, chronic disease or all sorts of things that, you know, there's loads and loads of information to be given out more hands-on stuff about how to support people um also counseling skills are really important you know i teach my people never ever be shocked like you might say to them what are you feeding the baby and she says coca-cola and you just say okay you know counseling skills are really important you elicit from them what they want to tell you in a kind non-judgmental way um that's a whole field in and of itself as to how to counsel women and how to teach um, and, you know, support them. Um, we, we have peer counselors at Turing. Um, you know, I, I used to be much more sort of more ma mainstream and I've become much less mainstream and much more um, <laughs> wild than I used to be. But, um, you know, in the olden days when people asked me about how to, in America, they say, you know, Hispanic women always do both. Like what? do you do and I would say well you know teach them that breast milk's best blah 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 what I say now is get a get a Hispanic Latina uh, breastfeeding counsellor that's what you do you get someone in their own culture to talk to them in their own language they trust them and that's what we do with our peer counsellors so we have two great peer counsellors Pierrette who's from Congo um, and Leila who's from Iran and they are Farsi speaking Lingala speaking, French speaking, they can speak to mothers in their own languages about their cultures um, and they are really, really supportive and it's a good thing. We have them, they are great. Anyone have a question? Could you talk a bit about pumps? Pumps? Mm. Yeah, so um, I don't, I haven't talked about pumps in this because I don't think that very many women in the circumstances here have access to pumps. Um, there are an awful lot of different kinds of pumps. Frankly, hand expression is a really, really good thing to teach people. Um, you can use hand expression to get your milk out. Women who get good at it can use it just as effectively as a pump, actually, and there's less equipment involved. Um, we, we have given out things like... Um, in, in the past, not we, me, but in the past, hand pumps and really kind of in, unhygienic kinds of pumps have been given out. Um, if a child is in the intensive care unit or if a baby is going, um, is, is um, being, um, is separated from the mom, like mom's gone back to work or something, then there are very good hospital grade or high professional grade breast pumps that can pump both breasts at the same time. Um, but, you know, we often say people don't, they, you know, they need all the equipment. You don't really need a breast pump unless you're going to, unless you've got a premature baby or you know you're going back to work. You don't have to buy a breast pump when you're pregnant. Um, but if you're going to use one, use a good one because the ones that are like hand pumps that don't work very well can be very discouraging because women feel that they think they're not making any milk when they're trying to pump. Mm -hmm. And they are actually. I don't know if there's anything more specific you wanted to ask Sally about that. Well, we sometimes get mums who are separated from their babies 
um, because in Greece they're super keen to take kids into hospital and send the mums home. Um, and we try to provide breast pumps, et cetera, and, 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 and sort of sterilizing stuff. And what have you. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So, yes. I mean, we're kind of limited to what we can buy in Greece. Do you, I mean, do you know which of the pumps? Are, which no, which I, you, I don't touch the off the top I mean, of I know, I know the bulb ones are awful. And I know oh, the, gosh, yes, I mean, the, the, the brands that are good are Hollister or Ag, Amidra Canal. It's they keep changing hand. The Amidra Canal, Hollister, and then there's Medela, which of course is not code compliant, but the pumps are very good. <laughs> They're very good pumps. Medela, who's, who's the third one? Well, no, there's two that I Amidra Canal, Hollister, they, they, they change the name. They're all the same. Oh, Amidra right, okay. Canal or Hollister, and then Medela. They all make good breast pumps. Um, I don't, Medela is European. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if anyone else knows the answer to that question, but I do know you should get an, a good electric one that pumps both breasts at the same time, but go easy with the mothers. You know, there's all sorts of stuff out there about hand expression and breast pumping at the same time. Um, and if the mom's doing it at the beginning and she doesn't make much milk, it can be very discouraging. So you mm. want to get, teach her about hand expression too. Okay, fine. Any Anybody else got questions? I'm so pleased so many people came on. I was saying that Sally at the beginning, I only announced this training yesterday and many people I've been trying to get in touch with for ages are all on the training. So thank you all so much for coming. I mean, it's just, it's great that we've got so many people here. Um, if that, if, does anyone else have any questions? Anything? No? Um, actually, I have a question Is about the premature babies. Mm -hmm. What should I do when we, find the premature baby, how, how can we feed them? So it's a good question. So it depends on the circumstances of the baby, right? Sometimes um, the baby can be a little bit premature, but it still goes home with the mother um, and she can breastfeed. Sometimes they can be very premature and some moms have to pump their breasts for months. Um, so if a mother is in that circumstances, the baby's in the hospital, you know, it's, Again, that's a whole talking of itself because because breast milk for premature babies is really important and it's mm -hmm. it really really helps them. So if the mother's in a position where she has to pump long term, she should be set a routine. Unlike breastfeeding, you can actually set a routine for pumping, and they need to pump. I'm afraid every three to four hours. I mean, they really should be pumping eight times a day um, during the night as well because you make a lot of milk during the night. Um, you know, not to add to the stress, there's a lot of counselling going on here because people who have a preemie have all sorts of stress to begin with. But really what you want to do is be pumping regularly. You want to, the pump unfortunately pretends to be the baby. So you, you need to pump every three hours or so. So like that you're pumping eight to 12 times in 24 hours. That means you will make enough milk for the baby. And then that milk should be collected for the very, very sick little babies that don't take oral, they can still put the colostrum on the baby's lips. It's called uh, colostrum care. Um, and then you want, you know, again, this is all advocacy because it's not happening in many countries, but you want the mom to have access to the intensive care unit. She wants to do skin to skin with the baby and feed the baby at the breast. NICU nurses in all countries can tend to be a little, I mean, I think that's why they're good NICU nurses. They're quite controlling. I mean, if I had to like leave my baby in the NICU in my, in many hospitals, I would leave it with the nurse, not the doctor. Cause you get doctors and residents and young doctors coming in, but the nurses are the ones that know how to keep a young small premature baby alive okay but they tend to sort of refer to it as my baby and we don't we don't want that we want the mom to come in the best NICUs I've seen there's a brilliant NICU in Chicago NICU is newborn intensive care unit at Roche Hospital they've done loads of research and there the moms are on the intensive care unit I mean they come in they do their own pumping they store their milk themselves they label it themselves um, you know you can get you can make milk high calorie by using the hind milk. So the beginning of the feed, when a baby starts to feed, you have more water mm. and the end of a feed, you have the higher fat milk. So in, in this NICU, in some NICUs, you know, they actually manufacture, they actually sort of moderate the milk so they can use the higher fat milk that the mother has pumped to give the baby more calories. Um, and the mothers actually test it themselves. They can, they use those things that turn, go, go around the spin centrifuges and they can see how much fat. And they've taught them to do all that. So, 
you know, I've worked in a lot of hospitals, like doing counselling in hospitals and helping hospitals to get better. And I know when I walk into an intensive care where the parents are comfortable, they just walk in there, they walk up to the bed, they open the curtains, they, you know, talk to their baby is they mess with the refrigerator they get the pump going they're confident in the in the intensive care unit and unfortunately you don't see that here but you know it really depends but the basic thing is that they want to they need to be pumping around the clock they need someone advocating for them in the hospital make sure the breast milk gets to the baby make sure the mother has as much access as possible to the baby um, and skin to skin care with will help to um, stimulate the mother's milk supply and also very young babies can breastfeed. They may not be able to breastfeed for long enough to get their full nutrition at the breast, but in Sweden, they have babies breastfeeding at 30 weeks gestational age. It's unbelievable what they can do, what they do in Sweden. They've got some of the best NICUs in the world in Sweden. They're just so family centered. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Gertrude. Uh, thank you for everything. And thank you for this meeting. That's okay. Thank you. And, I have a question. Do you have a, in the camp or a, a lot of uh, mothers or uh, or babies premature that uh, it, uh, they had to uh, stay on hospital because of their prematurity? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes we get them sent home despite the fact, home to the camp, despite the fact that they're premature. We have everything. Yes, we do have both cases. Okay. Um, the ones that we tend to get calls at from Turing about from Turing are moms in remote camps who had, an, had a baby that was premature that's not gaining weight that maybe stayed in the hospital a bit mother didn't breastfeed it because she was separated from the baby she didn't have access to a pump baby's back with the mother not gaining weight that's I would say that's probably one of the most frequent as we get from some of the groups we work with um, in the camps the, the, the premature babies are very scary really scary yeah and sometimes yeah. guys i mean we've had that terrible one that i mentioned recently that was a preemie sometimes there's a reason they're born premature they might have something wrong with them like why is this baby born at 30 weeks what's wrong with it like no most babies go to term like is there a problem and sometimes those problems don't get, get diagnosed and you have babies in the camps with holes in their hearts and tumor kidneys like these things go unnoticed until the baby's almost literally dying so the preemies mm -hmm. we really worry about the preemies because often they're not breastfed because the mom was separated for a long time now she's got the baby in the camp nobody's weighing the baby they don't even know how much the baby weighs twins i know sally's got one of her mom's that's been twins can be like that too you know you've got to really watch it you've got to watch it with twins then mother's already exhausted and then she's got twins usually twins usually are born a little bit premature usually they're not quite up to the normal weights twins can be another high i mean i told you all the babies we watch they're all high risk but preemies and twins and multiple births are more high risk okay and i think that uh, if you know that uh, this mother have more risk uh, to birth uh, in premature term uh, do you uh, care this mother more than the others or do you the i mean me i don't we, your... we don't have access i mean in an ideal world or even in a basic world those mothers should have definitely more careful monitoring the baby should be weighed more often yeah. it's not it's not happening it's not happening. These babies are not being seen by anybody. I mean, they don't have their vaccinations. Don't quote me on this, people. But we know. We see it. They don't. You know, it's not like there's some system. I mean, one hopes, mm -hmm. one hopes that there is enough system in some of the camps, some of the time. And I don't honestly know who's on this call, so I'm trying to be a little careful because I see some names <laughs> I don't recognize. Um, but our experience has shown us in the, some of the camps where we've worked that these babies are not followed. And we get calls from, um, we, we work with a lovely uh, organization called solidarity now again covid has made everything much worse there's less access to everything um, but solidarity now runs a lot of the mother baby spaces in a lot of the camps um, and they do tend to call us if there's like a problem and we try to triage it over the phone but without a weight on the baby it's really hard i mean they don't have not only do they not have a way they don't have a formula i mean they don't they don't have you know they don't it's um it's not it's not simple do that way it's not simple
one would hope the, that the few resources that are in the camp are there are able to capture these babies that are high risk um, and certainly they should have more monitoring than everybody else but it, it doesn't always happen um i have a question i don't know if it's a stupid one or not um there's no stupid questions yeah there are sometimes um <laughs> i try not to show it yes thank you yes i'm not feeding my baby um tell me so um, weighing babies does that need much training any training no 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 it's like it's dead easy it's like here's down. baby take nappy off put baby on weigh write it down it's as simple as that. yes and sometimes you know i mean some of the stuff in the camps it's like who's supposed to do it rather than who can do it i mean you can give the mothers a scale and they can weigh their own baby is there's not yeah um, and one you know we again empowerment you know we, i would be that's why we like having our peer counselors i mean honestly i'd be very happy to donate a scale to many of these camps and then we could just weigh, weigh their own babies you know always weigh them naked because well right now we're going to count the camps we're going to is cold you know they don't want to take the clothes off so we do and also time like we're seeing maybe 20 babies in a couple of hours so we say to the mothers look if you go to the doctor and you're inside, they will take the baby's clothes off and weigh it properly. And that is good. OK, um, and so your baby, if you take them down to Doctors Without Borders next week, he might actually weigh a little bit less than what he weighed today because we've weighed him with his diaper on. Um, and we do try to take off the snowsuits. I mean, you'll appreciate this, Sally. We in England think it's lovely and warm here in Greece because it's like 58 degrees. But everybody else here thinks it's like, you know, the middle of winter. And these children are wrapped up like, you know, it's, they're living in Alaska. So um, we do try to take off the really thick, heavy outer clothes. Um, and actually, for those of you who are familiar with MUAC tapes, it's been proved quite difficult to use MUAC tapes in the camps because again you have to undress the babies and keep them still and it's not warm i mean it isn't warm even you know for me it's not warm for a baby to be naked in a camp right now no we don't do that it's windy so we tend to weigh them with the clothes on but it's really straightforward and the scales they're not even that expensive you know i, I would say that it's really easy to weigh a baby now to know what you're looking for might not be quite as straightforward you know if, if a mom weighs her baby and it's eight pounds that may not necessarily teach her very much you know because we you, you want to follow them over time so your mother should know she wouldn't you know we don't want to weigh the babies obsessively after every feed to see how much they've had or weighing them once every month and the baby's not gaining weight or they think it's not gaining weight so you need a bit of knowledge as to what the weight might mean i would say is from our perspective but in terms of the actual skill needed to baby like going back to what i call the talk just don't drop the baby you know, that's it just don't drop it. Otherwise, anyone can weigh a baby. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, well, look, I'll wrap it up. I don't want to drag it on too long. Uh, thank you so much for all of you for coming. Um, hopefully you've got all got our address because you all got um, the initial email. If anybody um, wants you know, more help, Cheering has some funding to do some weighing and measuring and seeing some babies some of the times. We don't have it enough to sort of do every baby all the time, but we certainly really like to do these trainings. So if there's anybody out there who wants to um, like have a training for your people from whichever organization you're representing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we love to train people because as I said at the beginning, that means our reach is much broader um, and we can train you to do this stuff. So we don't have to actually go to every camp away, every baby. So um, please, please get in touch with me um, if you need trainings. Um, or also follow-ups. I, I really like the people at Solidarity Now. They're so great. And we did these kind of basic trainings with them. And then they came back to me and said, well, we have all these young women now who are breastfeeding advocates. Um, we need the next level because we, we need to know more how to support people. So, um, you know, we're always willing to do that too. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rana, for moderating. Um, if Rana, if you can keep the um, emails of anybody that wants us to send them a link to the presentation. Yeah, we'll I have them. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for attending and let me know if you need anything else from us. Okay, thanks very much, everybody.